If you come on West Forest and if you come in any black community, you see a lot of closed down schools. You see, you don't see enough community centers for black children to go to. I mean, you don't see nothing. You don't see a lot of black business owners. There's not enough jobs out here in this community. I'm seeing these older people working my job and they have family to support. Like, I feel like no grown adult should be making seven fifty dollars an hour if they have bills and they have responsibilities like kids. So how are you to pay this grown woman seven fifty dollars an hour? Or someone that's been working there 20 plus years and you don't even pay them what they really deserve. My little sister, my niece, my little nephews, like I'm fighting for them because I feel like they shouldn't have to live in poverty. They shouldn't have to struggle. Can Black Lives Matter grow from a local protest against police brutality to a real national movement? We ask organizer Alicia Garza, and then we go to Seattle, where gentrification is moving black communities out. Finally, I have a few thoughts on diversity and police brutality's gender gap. It's all coming up. Welcome to the program. Building movements without shedding differences. Our next guest was the co-creator of Black Lives Matter. It was a call to action for black people after the killing of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Ever since, others have been adapting the Black Lives Matter slogan and turning it kind of into their own, some version of All Lives Matter or something like it. Explaining why that's a problem is just one of the challenges the Black Lives Matter movement's facing. It's also up against a media that would love to narrow its goals to a few police prosecutions. Women are at the heart of the movement, specifically young black women, many of them calling themselves queer. One of those leaders is Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter and special projects director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Here to talk about the origins, inspirations, and next steps for Black Lives Matter, I'm very happy to welcome Alicia Garza to The Laura Flanders Show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, um, where to begin? Well, we must begin where it began. You and Patrice Marie Cullors and Opal Tometi co-founded Black Lives Matter. Who the heck are you, and how did you come up with it? <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, Black Lives Matter really started as a love note to our people in the aftermath of the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Trayvon Martin. I know I personally felt like I got punched in the gut. I have a 25-year-old brother who's six feet tall and has a huge afro and just the sweetest person you could ever meet. And he's growing up in a predominantly white suburban community. Um, and so was Trayvon. Right, And he was stalked and killed by an aspiring security guard who felt that Trayvon didn't belong there. And so Black Lives Matter was really a response uh, to some of the responses that we were seeing even in response to the acquittal. So we were hearing things like, on the sinist side, we knew justice was never going to be served for black people. Which, I mean, living black in America, we do know that it's rare that justice is served for black communities but that didn't feel like the right response. The other thing we were hearing was, this is a terrible tragedy, and so what we need to do is X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z being pull up your pants. X, Y, and Z being we need to vote, we need better education, we need stronger families. But all of those things really blame black communities for our own conditions. So Black Lives Matter was an attempt for us to rehumanize us in a world that so profoundly dehumanizes us. And it was a call to action. And we were able to both because we're all organizers and because people like Opal have incredible skills in building online platforms, we were able to use that to build connections online so that people can take action together offline. For a lot of people, your movement and your frame of Black Lives Matter really hit their consciousness this summer um, after the police killings in Missouri. 
talk a little bit about how this has grown, how your day-to-day -day managing and, and, and organizing is changing, and some of the things that you think you're up against. Well, I think what's important to know about Black Lives Matter and how it really took off is that uh, when Mike Brown was killed in August of 2014, uh, Patrice and Darnell Moore, who is a scholar activist here in New York, uh, called for a Black Lives Matter freedom ride. And that drew more than 500 black people from across the country who in 10 days raised the money, got on buses, vans, planes, however folks could get there to really support the work that was happening in Ferguson and also to bear witness to the incredible uh, Jim Crow situation that still exists today. Uh, from that ride, people got excited about and really felt passionately about bringing what they had seen and what they had learned back to their communities. So what we saw, right, were people who were inspired by the actions that people were taking on the front lines in Ferguson, the non-compromising way uh, that folks said, we will not compromise for our freedom, we are going to be free no matter what, um, the ways in which folks there were really challenging respectability politics, and also the ways that people were building relationships together, uh, knowing, right, that maybe folks hadn't been connected before, but certainly that they knew that they were going to be connected forever because of what had happened. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that we've seen it grow, right, is that it's moved uh, not just nationally, but internationally. We saw uh, Afro-Colombian domestic workers uh, sending pictures and photos saying Black Lives Matter. Uh, we saw folks from South Africa, folks from Ireland, folks from all over the world sending messages, not just of solidarity, but lifting up the conditions that black people are facing in, in their countries. And so the growth of the project, right, has really been a message of self-determination, of liberation, and a call to rehumanize us around the world, which has been incredibly inspiring. I, I don't even know what to say about that. It also gets to the point that I alluded to in the introduction, which is in their efforts to show their solidarity and their connection with you, to put the most positive spin on most of it, we've also seen this kind of genericizing of the slogan to all lives matter or, I don't know, my life matters. <laughs> You've written very powerfully about how shedding differences is not helpful. Um, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So first I'll say that um, changing Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter is not an act of solidarity. What it is is a demonstration of how we don't actually understand structural racism in this country. When we say all lives matter, that's a given, right? Of course, we're all human beings, we all bleed red, uh, but the fact of the matter is some human lives are valued more than others, and that's a problem. The other thing that we've seen, right, is replacing black with other things. I saw animal lives matter one time, and I just <laughs> threw up a little bit in my <laughs> mouth, actually. Uh, because, you know, in this country we commodify things, and we commodify movements. We see people like Ford, you know, doing commercials that say the American Revolution, right? Um, but what I think is important here is that we've been pushing people to really talk about what does structural racism look like in this country. It's not about people being mean to each other. That's just the smallest bit. It's about interpersonal dynamics that are backed by systemic power, right? Um, and so when we look at that, we see that black people are on the losing end of every disparity that you can possibly think of. And so not only is it not appropriate to not be paying attention to black lives in this country, but it's certainly not appropriate to just erase black from the conversation. And not only are black lives on the receiving end, as you put it, but black lives and stolen labor was at the heart of the way we created right. our society. Absolutely. That's an important piece of it too. You've said when black people are free, everybody's free. For people that sort of scratch their heads at that, can you explain? Sure. So the way that race works in this country is really on a black to white spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the closer you are to black, the worse off you are. Um, when we talk about black liberation being intrinsic to everybody's liberation, we're really talking about how systems in this country have been not only built off of the backs of black people and, and exploited labor, but certainly have been crafted to exclude and exploit black people. And so if we're able to dismantle those systems, everybody has a chance, a better chance of living a better life. 
For example, um, we have domestic workers in this country who still are not covered under federal labor protections because of a compromise between Southern lawmakers, right, and white controlled and dominated labor unions. Well, if we were able to, and that's a structural right. uh, issue. Right, back to the 30s, never been Absolutely. changed. Absolutely, never been changed, even today. Now, if domestic workers and farm workers had federal labor protections, right, that means that all workers in this country benefit because what it means is that there's not a separate and unequal system that you can be kicked in between, mm -hmm. right? If there's a group of workers that don't have rights, that means that your rights are being threatened, right? Because there's gonna be an excuse at some point to take your rights away from you. And we're seeing that now with the state of labor unions and the fight that people are waging even to form labor unions. Nobody knows that more than domestic workers. How does your work with the domestic workers relate to Black Lives Matter? You've touched on it right there, but in terms of structure, are you kind of straddling or is it all one or, or how did these two movements connect? <laughs> Everybody asks me that question. Oh, they do. Is it Tuesday and Wednesday? Right. It's from Thursday, it's from Friday. You know, it's really all the same work. So domestic workers and in particular the work I do with black domestic workers are mothers who are trying to protect their families from state violence. The way that we talk about state violence with Black Lives Matter is that state violence equals structural racism. And so not only have domestic workers who are largely black been uh, excluded from federal labor protections and now are largely immigrant, right? Um, but they are mothers who are living in communities that are being terrorized by unaccountable police departments. Uh, they are mothers who are living in communities where uh, the schools are failing, where there's a lack of investment, uh, where wages are falling, where there's high unemployment. Um, and these are also folks who are caring for other people's families and not having the space or the time or the resources to care for their own. And that has impacts on um, whether or not their family is able to survive. So it really is a, a one in the same. Uh, the other thing I think is important about the connection between the two is that it is all about empowering women, women of color, immigrant women, low-income women. It's about bringing the margins back to the center to really shape our vision for a new economy, a new democracy, and a new society. I'm with you right there. Women at the center. Women at the center. Women at the center, young, African-American, many of them queer women are at the center of the Black Lives Matter movement. Not that you would know that from the media coverage. <laughs> um, why? Why is it so hard for journalists to tell a story with leaders like yourself uh, getting the recognition they deserve? Maybe I shouldn't ask you that question, but ask someone else. But Some of it is habit and practice. Mm -hmm. Some of it is about, um, it's intentional at times. Um, but I do think that part of it is that the way that we understand how movements happen in this country is behind one charismatic leader. Right. And it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around a movement that is full of leaders. Um, but that's how our, our homes work. <laughs> that's how our communities work. That's how our workplaces work, whether or not we want to talk about it. And so we're just trying to reflect our own realities, right? And we're trying to create more pathways for more people to participate and engage. If we want a full democracy in this country, we can't just have people following one person. Everyone has to feel like they have a stake in shaping the kind of world that we live in. Otherwise, we get into a situation like the one that we're living in now, where nobody's happy uh, with the leadership that we're getting. Uh, and, and honestly, people don't know what are the pathways to participate besides casting your vote, which in, in and of itself is a very flawed system as we know. What does the word queer mean to you? <laughs> queer is, to me is an umbrella term uh, that incorporates folks who uh, are outside of the heterosexual norm and the what we call heteronormativity, which is a big word for uh, relationships. Marriage is just between a man and a woman. It's the patriarchal family as we understand it. Um, what's important to us in Black Lives Matter is that we are elevating and cultivating the leadership of folks who have not been included in the conversation. That includes black trans women, that includes black immigrant women, black disabled folks, black incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. Um, so to us, right, we're, we're really trying to queer our movement. We know even in our tradition and our legacy of black liberation um, that queer and trans uh, folks have been in the leadership, uh, however, have had to kind of cut pieces of themselves off because it wasn't acceptable 
Baird Rustin being an incredible example of that. Audre Lorde being an incredible example of that, right? Um, we want to create a different kind of movement culture. We think it's important, we think we need it, and we don't think that we can survive without it. So I hear that and I think, fantastic, the more the better, the more space for us to be human, the better. Other people hear it and they say, ooh, that sounds scary, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we've seen that reaction in social media. Um, how do we get beyond that? How do you work with people to get beyond their fears and instead embrace what our world might be like if everybody got, everybody, everybody got to be their whole selves? You know, honestly, the first thing that we do is we start with the people who are already ready and have been waiting for a long time for a movement like this to emerge. And then what we do is we create spaces that feel like home. We create community through our movement work. And then ultimately, it's not something that you can even deny. It's something that feels so good you want to be a part of it. Because when you look around you, it's so reflective of what our communities look like. We can't avoid that, right? Um, and we encourage people to lean in, like lean into what's uncomfortable about this for you, but also do the work, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, what is making you so uncomfortable about standing side by side with somebody who's queer or trans, right? Because you're doing it every day in your life. Do you run away from the people in your workplace or in your community who are different than you? I think one of the things that's important to talk about is this notion of solidarity. And oftentimes, the way that I've heard about it, at least, is about trying to homogenize people, right? We're all the same. We've got the same fight. You know, the reality is we're not, and that's what makes us so beautiful is that we're complex beings, right? Um, and so if we can celebrate those differences and learn from them, we can actually build better strategy together. We've had a conversation here where we haven't mentioned police prosecutions even once. Um, it would be great to get some prosecutions when police commit crimes that other people would be prosecuted for. Sure. Um, but it's not all that your movement's about, and I guess that's why I'm bringing it up at, at the end of our conversation. But the demands, insofar as there are demands of Black Lives Matter, how would you characterize them? I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, people are always like, what are the demands? And let me tell you, they're nothing different than what black people have been fighting for for the last 500 years. We want housing that's quality and affordable. We want free education. We want communities where people can live in dignity. We want to be able to live with our families without fear of being murdered by the people who are supposed to be protecting us. We want full and fair employment for everyone. We want all the things that we have been fighting for since our people were brought here as slaves from Africa. So this is not a new uh, set of demands, but it's certainly a new political moment where we have the opportunity to join movements together across these issue silos, which are not ways that people live their lives, mm -hmm. right? Um, and really try to advance a new program uh, for liberation in this country. And we're just getting started. And your relationship to party politics, electoral politics, Hillary Clinton? Well, I think what's important is for to hear from them what is their relationship to social movements that are happening in this country. Um, you know, again, I, I'm curious and I keep waiting to hear from folks beyond the slogan that they believe that black lives matter. What are you actually going to do to ensure that black lives matter? That's the real conversation we want to have. And your inspiration? Mm, my mother. My mother is my entire inspiration. She's just an amazing woman who fought like hell to make sure that I had everything that I needed and that I always believed that anything was possible. And she's a woman who's encouraged me to take risks and to be my weird self. And because of that, um, I'm so, so grateful. And um, I'm just inspired by her, her tenacity and her determination. And I'm inspired by the way that she supports me no matter what. And I love her to death. Alicia, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you for in. having me. Never moved anywhere, never been out the state of Washington. Just yes or terrorists. Basically, is all I know. Around right here, we all knew everybody. All my kids were, was raised here.
What they tearing down, I don't care what they put up. It's not going to replace what I've been through up here. We're not losing some object. We're losing a piece of what we've created. It's unbelievable how Seattle changed. People are coming in from all over the world. I used to call Yesa Terrace the Million Dollar Hill, but it's not the million, it's the Billion Dollar Hill. When this place was put together, and I was a little kid, it was for low income period. The people that gave them, that gave the city this land was for low income period. It wasn't for no condominiums up here to look over the water or nothing. So I don't like it, because you're going to lose. You see, it's like you got a park here, you got your backyards there. Oh, that's going to be gone. They're going to build so they can put more apartments, get them up there. More money. It's all about the money. They all chose to move outside or out of the city and they wanted to go to the suburbs. Now, for some reason, it's just that time again. New building here, new condo here. Tear this school down. New this, new that, new that. You're like, okay, it's time to move again. Let's get ready. It's not gonna be the same, never will be the same. Once they build it, I think my time's up. Try to go somewhere new, see something different. International Women's Day just passed, and as if on cue, we just saw another example of why paying attention to gender matters and how, for the most part, we still don't do it. In their blistering review of the Ferguson Police Department, Justice Department investigators reported that racism was everywhere, along with a long-standing practice of ignoring allegations of racial discrimination and abuse. In a city where two-thirds of residents are African American, just four out of Ferguson's 54 commissioned officers are black. This lack of diversity dominated the coverage, and rightly so. But the investigators also found evidence of something else, rampant sexual harassment by male officers, and a force with just four female officers. That detail showed up in a footnote. As the Washington Post, which caught the footnote, reported, that's the norm for the overwhelming majority of local police forces. Even though 20 years of research shows that women police officers tend to rely less on physical force and far less often get involved in misconduct suits. Way back in 2000, a study released by the Feminist Majority Foundation and the National Center for Women and Policing documented an enormous gender gap in police brutality. The city of Los Angeles, they reported, paid out $63 million between 1990 and 1999 in lawsuits involving male officers for use of excessive force, sexual assault, and domestic violence. By contrast, just $2.8 million was paid out on female officers for excessive force lawsuits by them, and not one female officer was named as a defendant in a sexual assault or domestic violence case herself. As abuse cases stay in the headlines, discrimination and the gender gap deserve more than a footnote. Will a diverse police department solve all our problems? Surely not. But if we're going to address diversity, let's remember there's more than one sort. You can tell me what you think by writing to me, laura at grittv.org. Thanks.
This week on the show, change within the system or changing the system? Activist entrepreneur Judy Wicks talks about her work to make business more human. We need to measure our success by uh, the well-being of our communities and the well-being of our natural world. While movement theorist Gopal Dianini explores how capitalism itself works. At some point, people are like, no, you cannot do that to me and to my community in my home. We got Eric Garner, who was choked to death um, in New York City. We got John Crawford, who was picking up a BB gun and shot and killed in Ohio. We got Ezel Ford, shot three times in the back in L.A., man. So to really, you know, see what's happening here and say, man, how can we connect the dots and really have some national movement against, like, the indiscriminate killing of people of color uh, by these police officers. To me, it's like, okay, man, well, how can we take that, you know, energy, you know what I'm saying? That, 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 that rage, you know what I'm saying, that anger, and can we manifest it into something, into where energy where we can actually connect the dots and change these laws. Don't shoot! 